Oh, they were still sitting on my desk. That would have been a short service. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming again tonight. Uh, this is part two of a three-week series. Last week's lesson, if you missed it, and some have asked, um, is still viewable on Southcrest's Facebook page, my Facebook page, and also I have a YouTube channel. It's on there as well. Because so many uh, asked for the scripture that all that I cited last week, I printed those or had those printed on the back of your notes tonight just so that you can have all those. There's a reason uh, that I began last week with specifically covering what the Bible does and does not say about the return of Christ. I learned a long time ago that not to assume that just because someone's a Christian, they know what the Bible says. Joel Furches once wrote, he said, atheists are often more informed on the Bible and Christian doctrine and history than most Christians. That's one of those ouch statements. So especially in regard to apocalyptic literature, opinions are plentiful. As such, my goal was just to help us understand the very basics about what the Bible says about Christ's return. In a few moments, we're going to look at Mark chapter 13, verses 28 and 29. Mark chapter 13, verses 28 and 29. Now we know, as we covered last week, that God makes it perfectly clear that no one knows when he's coming back. In Acts 1, verses 6 and 7, as Jesus is making his final comments before he ascends to heaven, Luke records, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. However, God always wants us to keep hope in view. In other words, we can't know the time, but we can know he's coming, and he's given us some breadcrumbs to follow that will lead us to that ongoing hope. This is why Jesus added the following in, Ma in Mark 13. This is also recorded almost verbatim in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. After Jesus had given these harbingers, these signs of his, that must be, take place before he returns, all three gospel writers record this lesson from the fig tree. Jesus said, as soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. So the figs, the fig leaves leafing is a harbinger of summer, a harbinger being something that signals the approach of something else. You hear a siren, chances are an ambulance is on its way. You hear, you see lightning, thunder is coming. Jesus is not saying, when you see these things take place, you can know the day and time I'm coming. What he is saying is when you see these things take place, you know that what I'm telling you is the truth by virtue of their very fulfillment. And because you see with your own eyes everything I'm saying to you come true, you know that I am setting the stage for my arrival. I'd like to make a couple of opening comments about this word called prophecy. It's a dangerous thing to get into if you're not careful and cautious and systematic and responsible in our interpretations of scripture. In Matthew chapter 24, verses one through three, Jesus was explaining to the disciples in view of the massive temple, not a stone will be left upon another and in three days it will be rebuilt. Of course, referring to his coming crucifixion and resurrection. And then we pick it up and it says, Jesus was sitting on the Mount Olives and disciples came to him privately and he said, hey, tell us, man, let us in on this. When will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So we're about to look at the state of the world in light of how Jesus answers this question. But let me first offer some caution and some wisdom. 
One theologian wrote, current events are no guideline for interpreting scripture. Those who continually adjust their understanding of scripture to accommodate the latest headlines are treating scripture like a wax figure can be shaped in any form that suits their purpose. This is not how to handle the word of God with integrity. You remember the early 90s, 90 and 91, with the Persian Gulf War. Churches were packed. Books were flying off the shelf as authors began to write about the coming, second coming of Christ. Do you remember 2020? The vaccine, often called the mark of the beast, which was foolish. I've had all three boosters. Not once have I had profane thoughts of Jesus, nor has my head begun spinning. <laughs> Last year, I'd been here just a few weeks. And so I guess as the new guy, when we received an odd phone call in the office, well, let's send them to Nick. <laughs> I'll never forget Allison in the office. She said, Nick, she hollered, are you familiar with the book of Revelation? I said, well, I somewhat. And she said, I just wanted to make sure you have a call on line one. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up the phone, this lady, the first thing out of her mouth was, do you know what the name Wormwood means? I said, ma'am, is that like beech or walnut? <laughs> no, I didn't, no, I didn't. I said, I know C.S. Lewis uses it as screw tape letters and I know it's used in the book of Revelation. Well, she didn't care. She just went on to tell me how this rocket Artemis, which was somehow derived from Wormwood, that NASA was sending up as an experiment around the moon that this was going to bring to us a nuclear winter. And you might laugh at that, but folks, this happens all the time. In 1999, as the uh, new millennium was approaching, there was one magazine that came out and on the front page it said, Revelation Revealed, Biblical Prophecy Decoding Kit Included. So people, they still waste their time trying to force a square peg into a round hole where prophecy is concerned. Don't try to form fit current events into biblical prophecy. One other thing. There's a phrase that theologians call telescoping prophecy. In Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 21, Jesus had taken up the scroll in his hometown synagogue. Synagogue means uh, gathering place. It was the Jewish local church. In Nazareth, and he began to read, in God's perfect timing, he read the scheduled reading for that week. So the hand of the scroll, Luke picks it up in chapter 4, verse 17. He says, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, quote, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, end quote. Then he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the tenant and sat down. And then he said to those in attendance, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now it's interesting that he set that scroll back down because he quit reading in mid sentence. What he read was fulfilled in their hearing. But the rest of his final sentence says, and the day of vengeance of our God is coming to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. So within the same passage, we have prophecy that is fulfilled immediately and we have prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. If you go north out of Raton, New Mexico, you cross the Colorado border, eventually you're gonna see the Rocky Mountains on your west, correct? From a distance, all the mountains look to be the same distance away. But in truth, there are some of those mountains that are closer than others. Some of the peaks which look like they're the same distance are actually tens or dozens or hundreds of miles beyond. That's telescoping prophecy. In Billy Graham's book, Approaching Hoofbeats, he said, throughout the centuries, the hoofbeats of the four horsemen in Revelation 6 have echoed and re-echoed across the pages of history. Deception, war, hunger, and death have haunted the human race to one degree or another since the day of Adam and Eve chose to rebel 
against God. In other words, he's saying these harbingers have in part be, been on display for a long, long time. And then he says, though the events we're about to cite don't tell us how close we are to Christ's return, they do tell us that God is right on schedule. One more mistake that we must not make is to focus solely on recent events. The last year or so, the last 10 or even 20 years, my objective is to look at Jesus' warnings here from a proverbial 30,000-foot flyover, to step back from the painting and be able to see the masterpiece that the master has painted in front of us. So let's step back from the timeline of recent years, and let's take a look at the past couple of centuries, shall we, to see if there's a pattern. All three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, every one they include every one of the following signs Jesus described that must take place before he returns. All of these signs serve as the leaves on a fig tree. Your first one is false Christs. False Christs, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Jesus starting here. In Matthew 24, 4, and 5, Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Now, there have been many of those along the way. We remember in 93, I think it was, Waco, Koresh, claiming to be the Lamb of God. But folks, this happens right under our nose. I have a dear friend who pastors another church here in town. Just a couple of years ago, he said a man had come up to the church, didn't know him. He began counseling him. About midway through the conversation, my pastor friend looked at the man and said, wait a minute, are you saying you're Jesus Christ? And the man looked at him and said, yes, I absolutely am. This sort of thing happens more than we are aware. But what you need to understand is there were false Christs or Messiahs before Jesus' time, and there have been others at various times since, including many in our own day. But in the end times, their number will vastly increase. In short, these are merely the precursor to the full embodiment of false Christs, which is the Antichrist. Next is war. First is false Christs. The next harbinger Jesus mentions is war. In Matthew 24, 6 through 7, he said, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed because these things must take place. In 2020, many people were literally living in fear. Well, Jesus said, it's just going to get worse, but don't be alarmed, man. I've got you. Satan is not the one in charge here. Be anxious for nothing. I've got you. And he says, don't be alarmed because these things must take place. But the end was not yet. He says, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So we know that war is nothing new. However, if we step back, it's within only the last century or so that we've had not one but two world wars. Further, we now live under the constant threat of nuclear war, with rogue nations continuing to develop nuclear warheads. In 1982, Billy Graham went to Moscow to preach the gospel in churches and to deliver a major address on the subject of peace to an international conference of religious leaders. He said to the people attending the conference, quote, the whole human race sits under the nuclear sword of Damocles, which is an allusion to the imminent and ever-present threat of annihilation. We sit under this sword not knowing when someone will push the button or give the order that will destroy much of the planet. And then he quotes Albert Einstein, who said, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything. On October 30th, 1961, on a remote island in the Arctic Ocean, Russia tested a thermonuclear bomb. It had a 100 megaton capacity. But they understood from mathematics that even on a remote island, a 100 megaton bomb would still be too cataclysmic. So they modified it down to half, to 50 megatons. Folks, for some perspective, this bomb that was invented 50 years ago 
60 years ago, still at 50 megatons, was almost 4,000 times the strength of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Nuclear holocaust, these are when ecosystems are destroyed by nuclear war and its aftermath. It's interesting, in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 14, now, what's being described here is the aftermath of a future war on Israel. Israel wins the war, and in verse 14 it says, quote, after seven months... Teams of men will be appointed to search the land for skeletons to bury, so the land will be made clean again. Now, the prophet Ezekiel existed centuries B.C., but here in these scriptures, we see what looks very much like the aftermath of nuclear war, as seven months or so are needed for radioactivity to finally subside. So nuclear war, though, is only one weapon in the arsenal of war today, right? Today, we live under the threat of chemical, biological, and cyber war. You remember when the railroads were shut down on the East Coast? It seems almost every few months, some major banking entity is breached by some uh, cyber criminals. The third, we have false Christs. We have war. Third, we have cosmic anomalies and ecological upheavals. Now, that's a mouthful. I realize that. Cosmic anomalies and ecological upheavals. The first thing I remember wanting to be as a child was an astronomer. So I follow several cosmologists, astrophysicists, and um, astronomers on social media. I thoroughly enjoy the subject. In Luke 21:11, Jesus said, there will be violent earthquakes and famines and plagues in various places, and there will be terrifying sights and great signs from heaven. Now, when I begin teaching Revelation verse by verse in the fall, and by the way, if you are not already a part of a life group, if you're not already a part of a life group, mine meets at 930 every Sunday morning up in the middle school room, which is about a quarter mile (laughs) that way, upstairs. And at that time, I will have more time to unpack the vast asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter and such things as that. But for right now, let me just highlight a USA Today article that came out in 1998, again, as the new millennium was approaching. There was an unusual amount of documented comments, uh, comments, comments. (laughs) So someone asked, what's happening? One of the scientists said, I don't know. We can't attribute it to anything, but it's unusual to have so much activity. Jesus said, I'm on my way. In Romans 8, 20 through 22, Paul wrote, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse that fell upon the earth in Genesis chapter 3. He continues, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The earth is groaning, folks, in anticipation of Christ's return. How many earthquakes do you think we have a year on planet earth? A couple hundred? That'd be a lot, wouldn't it? How about 20,000? Every year, the earth is groaning. The last major earthquake, of course, was just a few months ago in February in Turkey where over 50,000 people were killed. Do you remember the tsunami back in 2004 off the coast of Indonesia? How many people were killed? 227,000. The earth is groaning. Making a perimeter. Now, if you could see a map in your mind's eye, off the west coast of the United States. Obviously, you have California, Oregon, you go south down to the Baja and Mexico. But you keep going north up Canada and um, Alaska, the Bering Strait, Russia, then all the way over to Asia and down that coast there. Scientists call that the ring of fire. Nothing to do with Johnny Cash. (laughs) Love is a burning thing. And it may. (laughs) 
I know, focus. <clears throat> the ring of fire. So this perimeter is about 25,000 25, miles in this horseshoe shape. In it is approximately 90% of the world's earthquakes. The region also contains 452 volcanoes, more than 75% of the world's active and dormant volcanoes. California, Oregon, you know, they've talked about wanting to, to secede. They may well get their wish whether they want it or not. <laughs> Forbes magazine just last month ran an article talking about a leak of the, at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. It's around 50 miles off the coast of Oregon, spewing what was originally thought to be water, but now scientists have suggested it is tectonic lubricant. Now let me explain this. We know that if you don't put oil in your car engine, what's going to happen? That thing's going to lock, nothing good. It's going to lock up. If those parts begin to fire against one another, it's, you, you could even have a horrible wreck if those things were to just start flying everywhere, throw a rod and so forth and so on. So this lubricant is coming from what they call a mega thrust, the boundary between two of Earth's tectonic plates. And it's shooting out from the bottom of the ocean like a fire hose. According from the press release, the researchers believe this is the first known leak of its kind. Now, this article is just a month old, though they believe it's possible there are more nearby. Now, let me read this. The mega thrust is the area between two tectonic plates, one of which is under North America. Because of the loss of fluid, it could lower the fluid pressure between the two plates. It's that lubricant. You know, it's kind of like if you put wood flooring in your house, you have to let it breathe because it's going to contract and expand, right? Well, that lubricant is needed for those tectonic plates to be able to move up and down without causing cataclysmic damage. The scientist says if the fluid pressure lowers, the two plates will lock. And that's when the stress will build up. The fluid allows the plates to glide against each other smoothly. So without it, the plates would lock, creating stress that can result in a magnitude 9.0 earthquake. Now, to give that some perspective, the earthquake that killed over 50,000 people a few months ago in Turkey was a 7.7. So we have the false Christ and the war and the cosmic anomalies and the ecological upheavals. Jesus continues with persecution in Matthew 24, 9. He says, and they will hand you over to be persecuted and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. In Mark 13, 13, Jesus said, and you will be hated by everyone because of my name. In John 3, 20, and 15, 18, and 19. He said, everyone who does evil hates the light. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And then Paul summed it up in 2 Timothy 3.12 where he said everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, persecution is nothing new. Jesus was persecuted. The apostles were all martyred according to tradition. And then through history, we have the reformers, Tyndale burned at the stake, Luther put under house arrest. In 2014, the independent uh, news publication ran an article. It said most people in the West would be surprised by the answer to the question, who are the most persecuted people in the world? According to the International Society for Human Rights, Christians are the most persecuted people in the world. Jesus said, you will be handed over to be persecuted. In 2015, one news headline read, bloody strategy, Boko Haram adopts ISIS goal to wipe out Christians. In 2019, a report commissioned by the British Foreign Secretary concluded that anti-Christian persecution is nearing genocide levels. And then the voice of the martyrs, one of the ministries given to this topic, 
said the threat against Christianity and the Bible is so strong in North Korea, even saying the word Bible elicits fear. Now, we don't have this level of persecution in the USA yet, but my friends, it's coming. However, we see the stage being set by the strangling of free speech manifested in the cancel culture. The trendy term is hate speech. That word hate is a subjective term. George Orwell once said, the further a society drifts from the church, the more it will, I'm sorry, the more a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Voltaire, the atheist, 17th century French philosopher said, if you want to know who controls you, look at who you are not allowed to criticize. Look, you speak biblical truth today and you can be expected, you can expect to be derided as fill in the blank phobic. There are a lot of people on this planet, they're, they're Christ phobic is what they are. In fact, uh, Dave Rubin, he, he's a talk show host, he is not a Christian, but he said, you want to know who the most intolerant people are today? Those who are telling us all to be tolerant. Look, disagreement does not mean hate. It does not mean hate, man. It, this thing is a moving target. The, the finish lines always move because first we're asked to simply uh, uh, tolerate or accept different ideologies that are contrary to biblical truth. But then the finish line is moved. You can't just tolerate it. Now we want you to affirm it. Oh, but wait, affirming is not good enough either. We need you to celebrate it. My friend, I'm not going to. I'm not. Disagreement does not mean, hey, Rick Warren said this. He said, and this is my favorite. He said, our culture has adopted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. That's the media narrative. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. Jesus was profoundly, he was able to profoundly love people while simultaneously profoundly disagreeing with their lifestyle, right? Now they killed him for it anyway. Now, folks, he's telling us it's coming, but you stick by the truth. I'd rather be persecuted and in the middle of the will of God than have everybody like me and me be headed for somewhere bad. He's saying, I got you. The next is apostasy. In Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Paul wrote, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, in last days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving, spirit, deceiving spirits and things taught by demons, the doctrine of demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. So we now live in what's called a postmodern or post-Christian society, culture. What does that mean? It means that unlike even 50 years ago, the Bible is not readily respected anymore. It means also unlike 50 years ago, the Christian faith is no longer the default faith. It's an, it's an option. Natasha Crane wrote a book called Faithfully Different, Regaining Biblical Clarity in a Secular Culture. She said today in this progressive gospel, which is no gospel at all, feelings are the ultimate guide. Happiness is the ultimate goal. Judging is the ultimate sin. And God is the ultimate guess. In Jude, Jesus' half-brother Jude, he said, Dear friends, in verse 4, I've been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. And he said, Now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. That's us, your saints. You're holy, you're worthy, you're righteous. Not because of we, what we've done, but because of what Christ did. He said, I say this in verse 4. Because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. 
They're rewriting scripture, massaging a little bit, like Satan in Eden. Did God really say? Now, why would he write this warning? Alyssa Childers wrote a book called The Progressive Gospel. She is, by her own admission, a devout Christian who simply went through a time of truly doubting her faith. And that's okay. Doubt's not a bad thing as long as you don't just live in the doubt. You got to also doubt your doubts. But here's what she said. She said, my faith was intellectually weak and untested. I had no frame of reference or toolbox to draw from when every belief I had been so sure of was called into question. So she's receiving teaching that just is making her not know what she believes anymore. She says, and it wasn't an atheist, secular humanist, Hindu, or Buddhist who facilitated my eventual faith crisis. It was a Christian pastor. Jude describes these people as unthinking animals who do whatever their instincts tell them. They're like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. And they're like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. Next is lawlessness. Matthew 24, 12, Jesus said, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. 2020, we were given a front row seat to watch humanity lose its ever-loving mind. The depravity of mankind was on full display, and folks, it still is. In some places, you have complete anarchy. It's madness, man. Isaiah wrote in 520, woe to those who call evil good and good evil and who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Vody Balcom said, man, our, 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 our nation is not going nuts because of who they vote for. They're going nuts because they love darkness more than the light. In 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, it says, in the last days, people will be without self-control. Now, although end time lawlessness will certainly include disregard for human laws, it will be manifested most vehemently in increased regard for God's laws. This lawlessness will be diabolically aggressive and unabashed. And rather than hide it, people will flaunt it. Do you know how many times I see on social media people actually filming their insanity? As these groups of kids are just going into the mall or some Walmart and taking everything they can possibly take or beating an elderly man, man, it goes on and on. I sit there. I can't even watch it. My blood pressure grows. I, I just I about lose my mind. It, it's insanity, man. But l- let me include this too. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, It's also another passage in which Paul is talking about the last days. And he says, in the last days, these things will take place. And one thing he includes is disobedience to parents. Now, I'm going to tell you something. My first church as a youth pastor was in 1983. That is about the the time Michael Jackson released his Thriller album the first time. It was a long time ago. Do you know what's most, if someone were to ask me, what is most different now from when you began youth ministry in 1983, I don't even have to think about it. Disrespect for authority. In the last days. It's no wonder that Paul in 2 Corinthians, I'm 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, uses a name the Bible assigns to the Antichrist as the man of lawlessness. The last thing I want to mention to you, this harbinger is Israel. Now in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 10, summarized, it's the valley of dry bones. Ankle bones connected to the, you know, shin bone and so forth. They work our way up, right? The old spiritual. But the picture is, is God bringing back to life his people because they have been scattered. The northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians, taken into exile. The southern kingdom, Judah, because they had already been divided by this time. Southern kingdom, Judah, conquered by Babylon, taken into exile. It's been a mess ever since. No chance of that nation ever coming back again. No human chance. 
And so in verse 11 through 14 of Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel said, Then God said to me, Son of man, these bones that you see are the house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We're cut off. He says, Ezekiel, give them some hope. Prophesy to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people. I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. Jeremiah, not the bullfrog, in chapter 30, verse 18. He said, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt on its mound. In other words, we're not just going to come back together and set us up someplace. They're coming back home. And the palace shall stand where it used to be. One more, Amos chapter 9, 11 through 15. In that day, God says, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. And we rebuild it as it used to be. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. In November 1917, over two millennia, two, two and a half millennia since this prophecy was given. Arthur Balfour, the British foreign secretary, established a legal framework called the Balfour Declaration, setting the stage for the Jews' return to Palestine. The next month, God took care of the Ottoman Empire that had been described to some as in league with the Antichrist, evil. He moved them out of the way. And then... The British forces under General Edmund Allenby in regard to the Ottoman Empire and their victory shares that they were able to capture Jerusalem without a single shot fired. God doesn't need our weapons. Going to lay down that sword and shield, right? Down by that riverside. So on May 14th, 1948, after some 2,500 years now, you see, we're stepping back with a 30,000-foot flyover. David Ben-Gurion proudly pulled himself up to a podium just like this in the crowded Tel Aviv Museum and read these words, and I quote, It is the self-evident right of the Jewish people to be a nation as all other nations, its own sovereign state. Accordingly, we meet in solemn assembly today, thus by virtue of the natural and historic right of the Jewish people and the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state to be called the State of Israel. One person at the time wrote, quote, Do not we who are looking for the coming of our Lord feel a thrill go through us as we read of the dry bones coming together? Oh, he's right on schedule. Satan wasted no time unleashing his fury in 1967 in June. War was declared on Israel by Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Keep in mind, Israel has been a nation for less than 20 years. The Arab air forces were reinforced by aircraft from Libya, Libya Algeria, Morocco, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia and weaponry from Russia, including their MiG fighter jets. Against all odds, outmanned, outweaponed, outorganized, Israel was surrounded on all sides by hostile nations with advanced weaponry. Yet in six days, Israel defeated three Arab armies, gained territory four times its original size, and became the preeminent Military power in the region. That is God. Israel resoundingly defeated its enemies in a stunning six days. It's uh, not long after that, Israel Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, of course, he was eventually assassinated, but he gave this reasoning behind the victory. He said, our armored troops beat the enemy even when their equipment was superior to ours. People keep asking for technical, technological explanations. Did you have secret weapons? He said, we had none. 
Our airmen struck the enemy's plane so accurately that no one in the world understands how it was done. It reminds me of Elisha's servant when Elisha said, Lord, open my servant's eyes. And he goes out and sees the enemy surrounded by angels on chariots of fire. Theologian William Moore said, there isn't the slightest doubt but that the emergence of the nation of Israel among the family of nations is the greatest piece of prophetic news that we've had in the 20th century. In closing, one author wrote, with the rebirth of the nation of Israel, the prophetic clock which had been stopped since the time of Christ now began to tick. Prime Minister Ariel Shalom once said, the Temple Mount is the most volatile square kilometer on the planet. Satan doesn't know exactly what's coming. He knows something's coming. And he'll do everything he can. He can't take our faith. He can only attempt to weaken it. Something's happening. The sands in the proverbial hourglass are slipping through. In fact, in Revelation, it says the devil was thrown to the earth and he came in great fury because he knew he knows his time is short. Satan is aware that something is going on. As such, the warnings Jesus described in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 will, like birth pains, grow more frequent as well as more intense. The increasing chaos of the world, and it will increase, resulting from the signs Jesus listed along with growing hatred for Israel, will create fertile ground for the rising of a leader who will appear to have all the answers. Billy Graham described it this way, the world that has rejected God's Christ will now be ready to receive the devil's Christ. That is where we pick up next week. Let's pray.